All right, I think uh, time to get started. Uh, we're fortunate today to have Professor Mariana Sepernova joining us uh, from the University of Delaware, uh, where she is a professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, she received bachelor's and master's degrees from Moscow State University uh, and a PhD from the University of Notre Dame. Uh, Mariana is an atomic theorist whose specialty is high precision uh, structure calculation, calculation methods uh, and implementing them to study a wide range of systems uh, spanning from precision measurements uh, to fundamental physics, to symmetry violation, to quantum science, uh, and more. She's a leader not only in the ability to calculate atomic structures uh, and interactions uh, with an accuracy and precision needed for modern uh, experiments, and in some cases exceeding uh, the precision of the experiments, uh, but also in coming up with new ideas about uh, what you can do with that precision. Uh, today, she will tell us about some uh, interesting new directions which will be enabled uh, by rapid advances in atomic clocks uh, and the theory behind them. Uh, many of us in the AMO community uh, know her not just through her research, uh, but also through her very back, uh, active involvement in that community. Uh, for example, her extensive uh, service with the American Physical Society, where she is a fellow. Uh, so, Mariana, it's great to have you here, and uh, please join me in welcoming Mariana. Thank you so much for the invitation and introduction. Can people on Zoom still hear me? Yes, sounds good. Excellent. So first, I would like to ask every student here to think about one questions to ask about the talk. I will stop a couple of times during the talk in the middle so you can ask questions. And I would highly encourage you to do so, not only in my talk, but all the other talks you hear. <clears throat> Actually, do you have, uh, do I have to, we don't have the slide. Uh, To move the slides, I don't think. Okay, because as of now, actually, yeah, I can just, uh, click click somewhere on the slide, and then it should work. I can also run and get, grab you a clicker if you like. Okay, I have okay. one right downstairs. Okay. But that's okay. Uh, don't worry about it. Okay, as long as I can switch to this. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let's first put things in a perspective. Hundred years ago, we thought we knew everything about the universe. It was amazing. People really thought that all which is remain after we sort out the mechanics, the thermodynamics, the electromagnetism, is just to measure things more precisely. And they were pretty happy with technologies of 1922, which recently appeared due to uh, all the advances in electromagnetism as all the other fields of science and the chemistry, it seems like a great era. And yes, there were problems. For example, those pesky issues with atomic spectra. They could not explain them. And somehow that didn't seem to bore us a larger community in terms of uh, declaring that all physics pretty much been understood at this point. And it's been 100 years and we seem to make a full circle. Now we have our standard model, by the way, who knows how many of those particles were known 100 years ago? Anyone venture a guess? Electron, absolutely right. We could argue whether photon could be classified as known by the time, probably not. And uh, uh, of course, they happily discover a proton, but of course, it turns out to be that's not an even elementary particle. So, would you monitor the chat if there's something appear in the chat? Because I have no control over the chat. Okay, perfect. So, now all of our modern physics right now is based on standard model plus our fundamental physics postulates, which I described. And again, it looks like we actually are extremely successful. We have extraordinary number of physical processes very well explained by standard model quantum mechanics and now fundamental physics postulate here. But again, we have major issues. For example, if the standard model were true, our universe will not exist because there is a matter and a matter uh, asymmetry in the universe and there is a no mechanism in the standard model to explain why do we exist in the first place. So it's not that we just have a you know, four sigma here or maybe seven sigma there. It's the fact that we have a major issues with the standard model. In fact, the standard model is less than 5% of our known universe as we understand it from the observations. In our dark matter and dark energy, okay, we are pretty sure those are two different things, but we essentially have no idea what they are. We have better idea what they are not at this point, but that's pretty much it. 
And the other things about really the fundamentals of our modern science. What do we assume when we compare experiments? It's been so long ago, we nearly forgotten that there are a lot of assumptions there. And those are assumptions. They need to be experimentally tested. We assume, for example, Lorentz invariance. We assume that if you take your lab and rotate it, and of course, Earth does rotate, or move it in a certain direction, nothing has changed. We assume position invariance. We generally assume if you make your experiment on June and January, that shouldn't make a difference. We assume the equivalence principle. We assume that fundamental constants are constant, and that seems to be no-brainer. Of course, I open my textbook, and here it says constants, right? But they're not necessarily constant. And of course, we assume the standard model. We assume these are our elementary particles and their interactions. And we already know that this has to be incomplete because their dark matter is definitely not there. That at least we ruled out. The dark matter is not a part of the standard model. The constants are not constant and actually a very large number of beyond the standard uh, model models. In some of quantum gravity model, we can do away with Lorentz invariance. You don't have to, but you could. And then uh, both position invariance and the equivalence principle actually could be violated just by ultralight dark matter, just by the halo normal dark matter if it turns out to be okay. So in this case, uh, how do we look for a lot of those different things? And of course, there is fantastic effort in uh, particle physics and cosmology, but a lot of interesting things have happened in the past 20 years in atomic physics. That's my aim of physics in one slide. Okay, so what happened? What happened since 1995 to now is that atoms are no longer hot. They're ultra cold. And it's just that atoms are ultra cold. Atoms are now highly charged ions that can be made ultra cold. That's a fantastic new experiment just uh, uh, in PTB. And the molecules can now be ultra cold as well. Then they're also trapped. We can literally trap individual atoms by light or by different fields. So, and there are different devices for different types of neutrals or charged systems. And they're also precisely controlled. And our enormous effort in quantum information in the past 20 years yielded a fantastic improvement of quantum sensors and uh, all the other types of those devices. And this exceptional precision in quantum sensors opens new way to search for new physics and test fundamental physics postulates. And you may ask, besides the fact uh, that that would be interesting to do, but you, like, why would you do that? And besides the fact that we already know some specific new physics target you want to search for, you have to remember that all of those fundamental symmetries in which, which are the cornerstone of modern science, these are assumptions which are now have not been tested at the level of precision of quantum sensors. For example, the Lorentz invariance with electrons, the best limit come from optical atomic clocks. You wouldn't know that it holds for electrons, at the 10 to the minus 20 level, if not for atomic clocks. So, and so is actually all those fundamental physics searches that we actually are looking to test the fundamental ideas. And also we're searching for dark matter, dark energy, and all the other new physics, new forces, et cetera. If you're interested to learn more, and also if you're interested, how would you define a quantum sensor? I've been asking me times, what is a quantum sensor? Like what particular criteria my device should fulfill to be defined quantum sensor. So uh, Dmitry Butker and myself put together a special issue <laughs> in the quantum science and technology. The issue has now been closed, there are 20 papers, and they're not just research papers. They are the top proposals for new physics discoveries with quantum sensors. They actually specifically allow us to uh, actually have this focus issue about the future. And uh, in our editorial, quantum technology and the elephants, and yes, the editors allowed us the word elephants in there, archive bin, by the way. We decided that we are going to define at least our understanding of the quantum sensor. And we decided to take a broad view that any technology which, or device which has to be described by quantum mechanics is a quantum device. And then we decided that the quantum sensor is a device, the measurement or sensing capabilities of which 
are enabled by our ability to manipulate and read out this quantum state. And we kind of went around a little bit back and forth between different definitions. So it's not enough to read out. You need to be able to manipulate, which means the spectrometer is not a quantum sensor, but atomic clock is. Or by the way, the idea of molecular experiment. A few years ago, we noticed that this whole effort on this new physics searches with atomic and molecular experiments really sort of took off. We saw kind of an exponential increase in number of uh, papers, ideas, experiments, and they promoted more and more collaboration with particle theory as well. So we put together a review. So uh, that was uh, current status of 2018. There were 1,100 references in there. And by the way, just from the time that we submitted it, and then we got it back from referees, we had to add another 100 new references. Because people keep emailing us, look, there's cool new stuff. So at the point of proof, we said that everything goes to the you know, next reviews afterwards. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we've been asked uh, after this review to try to summarize the status. So I had people from CERN say me, send us one slide about this new physics for this AMO. I said like, no, 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 I cannot do it on one slide especially all with one pictures. So I tried to do two slides. So there is this, just to sort of give you a broad overview of what the scope of research is, what type of different devices are involved. So there's of course, fantastic effort to search for EDM with atoms, molecules, and molecular ions. There is idea how to actually look for hydronic EDM, so parity violation. There is tremendous clock, clock effort for many, many different reasons. And they're looking at many different clock configurations, atomic clock, molecular clock, now nuclear clocks, which I'll talk about, clocks in 1D, 3D, trapped ions, highly charged ions. There's a tremendous effort with clocks, and they can do a lot of fundamental science. And there is also atom interferometry effort, and now this is no longer necessarily a tabletop. So the biggest divide now is 10 meters, and 10 meters is not exactly tabletop at this point. They can actually separate atomic clouds by half a meter, and then they can recombine them and they still remain coherent. So it's really quantum mechanics at microscopic distances. So right now, Fermilab is actually building half a meter atom interferometer as a prototype gravitational wave detection. And there are also efforts in Amiga, uh, Ion and Ziga in the UK, France, and China. There is, of course, you know, one of the oldest tests of uh, fundamental physics, QED test, quant to test quantum electrodynamics. But in this case, they're kind of in a very new regime. They can literally trap a single highly charged ion and hold it there for months. So it's a really individual spin flip uh, result, you know, uh, type of experiment that's also now quantum. Of course, there is uh, uh, many, many various ideas and also current experiments to search for QCD axion which will solve a strong CD problem and various action-like particles in all the different regions. And then many new ideas are uh, looking for actually spectroscopy for fifth force searches, magnetometry for uh, exotic physics, and very many interesting ideas, levitated <coughs> optomechanics, slow gravitation wave detection, dark matter searches, fifth force searches and other experiments. And of course, CPT tests with anti-hydrogen, anti-protons, and uh, um, there is actually quite a lot of new things happening. And I ran out of space at that point. There are serial neutrino searches, actually, and there is an idea for WIMP searches, which starts like, I have a cubic meter of diamond within the centers. You know, the weekly interactive massive, massive particle just shred part of those in the centers, which is a remarkable uh, new ideas and experiment. And there are many, many different action searches and other. So as you see, uh, there is enormous sort of body of work for both dedicated and already built quantum sensors uh, to look for various new physics, and uh, this list is growing and growing uh, right now. So today I will talk mostly about dark matter searches uh, with atomic clock and future nuclear clocks, and talk a little bit about atom interferometry for gravitational wave detection. Any questions? So for uh, people joining on Zoom, you can raise your hand uh, or type something in the chat window, and we'll keep an eye on it. Okay. Have you ever used a GPS? Then you use an atomic clock. In fact, you use quite a few atomic clocks, which are on orbits on Earth. What? Do you have someone on Zoom? Okay. 
So uh, in the, look, GPS is great. If you ever try to test how accurate it is, have you ever hiked, you know, in place without trails, looking at your, <laughs> you know, GPS device, you know, it's a few meters there. So uh, when you know your, your, old, your, old, your old trail map. But the clocks on GPS, those are very, very old clocks. So in fact, if you actually look at the progress of clocks, the clocks on GPS based on microwave transition. So this is this blue curve here. And uh, that means that actually breaks on transitions, which is about, you know, 10 to 40, hertz, uh, you know, 10 gigahertz. And there is a principal reason why you can't improve them anymore. So we got to about 10 to the minus 16 with microwave clocks, but there is a technical and the fundamental limitations why you can't build better microwave clock. The optical clocks uh, frequencies are about five orders of magnitude higher, four to five orders of magnitude higher. And the progress has been tremendous. I mean, there's been no progress before frequency comes because people couldn't even measure the optical frequencies. But now, uh, this point, when it says 10 to the minus 18, uh, that doesn't tell you much. But just to put it in, in the perspective, that clock will not lose one second in the lifetime of the universe. Those are extraordinary devices. And uh, there's no reason, there's no technical reason why we cannot improve much, much further. And uh, we have been about order of magnitude every five years kind of new slow here. So I will talk a little bit about what is a clock. So the basic idea of the optical atomic clock that you tune the laser to the frequency of the atomic transition. So this is an absolutely self-enclosed device. If you have that device, you can use it for navigation. It keeps exact time. It doesn't drift, essentially. Uh, beyond the level of its final uncertainty. So the basic idea, your atoms are your frequency standard. It's kind of the device you'll connect to uh, tune your musical instrument. And here's your laser. So essentially you're tuning it until you're in perfect resonance. That's a basic idea how clock work. So does this imply that a GPS could be improved by a thousand? Volts? Of course. If, in fact, we already have commercial based devices which are better than GPS by orders and orders of magnitude, but it's very expensive to replace anything in space. And GPS kind of, you know, good with smaller needs. And they have been replacing them, you know, kind of slowly. So, but yes, I mean, but upgrading the GPS would be expensive. So uh, the most important point is how do you track something which much further away from Earth? Like you have those ideas for Mars missions. You actually do want the clock on board of those things. And I'll talk a little bit about it. But yes, the GPS, it's a very old clock. It's so old. The accuracy is not even actually on that plot pretty much. So, so in terms of out on the clock, so what do we actually measure? So we tune the laser, we make an excitation, and we see actually whether the atoms do actually get to be in superposition of this uh, two levels or not. And eventually we have the maximum probability for the excitation. So what we actually measure is the population of atoms. And when you measure the population of atoms, you essentially back to quantum formation. It's essentially a two-level system. And remember, when you make one measurement, how much bit of information you can get? One, zero, or one. So there is a quantum projection noise that every time you make a measurement, you essentially can just learn uh, one bit of information. So you have to repeat it over and over and over. And essentially, and that's what's called quantum projection noise, by the way. And uh, that is essentially how you determine the frequency of your atomic transition. You uh, fix your laser, and then you count your laser uh, frequency with a frequency comp. Of course, you eventually hit a snag that to measure absolute frequency, you need to know what one second is. And one second is defined as cesium. And cesium is 10 to the minus 16. So those clocks are now two orders of magnitude better than your standard of time. So what you could do, you can actually measure the ratios of frequency of two clocks to 10 to the minus 18. So you can compare those clocks at 10 to the minus 18 level. And eventually, the one second would be redefined. So what does application of those clocks? The GPS, of course, the deep space probes, when you actually have a satellite, do you know how does it know where it is? It talks to Earth. And there are very few dishes, these radio dishes on Earth, which actually would get you the position of satellites. So the more satellites you have, especially the more missions you get, you get missions eventually with Artemis to the moon, you want to send people to Mars. The more of those things you have around, the bigger is bottleneck, in getting information out of it because it's all going through Earth. The spacecraft literally have to ask us, where am I? And clocks, actually, precision clocks on board, it doesn't even have to be 10 to the minus 18. It could be a clock as a deep space mission, for example, 10 to the minus 15 drift clock, and already good enough to do the deep space navigation autonomously. Why? Because if you have a clock on board 
of your spacecraft, that it knows exact time. If it knows time, it knows where it is. Because according to law of gravity, it goes exactly where it's supposed to go. So it's a problem why it doesn't know exactly where it is. It doesn't know what time it is. And that's what actually Earth's information tells us. And eventually, we'll redefine the second yet again. And uh, that's going to be one of the optical clocks eventually. The very long baseline and interferometry, if that goes to space, it will need high precision clocks to synchronize. It. Then the relativistic geodesy, it means defining the Earth's gravitational field. At this point, 10 to the minus 18 is one centimeter of height. The clock can tell now, actually, 10 to the minus 19. There's been an experiment that shows that there is a, a large optical uh, lattice, and you use it as a two parts of the same clock. And you can actually tell the difference of height where the atom is due to the clock rate at one millimeter. That is actually urgently awaited by geodesy people who want to place those clocks in different places, in different countries. It's what's called tidal gauges, which define where is zero uh, meters in those countries. Do you know how much difference they are? They differ by half a meter, which is ridiculous because no one can agree exactly which one is the right measurement. With clocks, you can tell exactly what the difference in height is between two places. And there have been effort in portable clocks because of this now. There have been even more crazier proposals. A clock can tell you if you have a large volcano if magma chamber is filling up. Well, you need about one cubic kilometer of it, but I mean, there are pretty, there are pretty large magma chambers around. And then, of course, the clock is essentially a quantum simulator. It's a, a naturally quantum device. In some of the clocks, could be quantum degeneracy, and that's actually a fantastic device to uh, run the various many body simulation. And the topic of today talk that clocks can search for fundamental physics and then maybe detect gravitational waves. And I'll talk about how that works. So the atomic clocks, what can they do what they're best at? Yes. Yes, so the question is whether the uh, various effects, for example, the tidal effects from the moon, whether they actually counted in comparing clocks. Yes, more than that, there are actually things called solid tides, which I didn't know about, which apparently our Earth's crust actually breezes by about a foot. So uh, right now, there is also corresponding gravimetry measurements. For the most precise clocks, they actually have quantum uh, classical gravimetry people to come in for example, to Nist and Jilla, and exactly takes the difference in gravitational potential. So I, but this is the idea here essentially to, to turn it around. They, they have mod, models for the tides. What they don't have, they don't have, they are not able to do the fast level variations. The clocks can integrate very fast. So yes, all that accounted for, and you can kind of invert it and also to see the variations in real time. So you can use this device as a measurement or you can use this device to verify some of the classical devices as well. But now the clocks can integrate to 10 to the minus 18 in a few seconds precision. And no classical device can actually do it on the time scale. They even thinking that maybe you can essentially look at climate changes in real time, looking at the height differences. Uh, but at that point, there is actually a very large review. I, I'm happy to send about the geodesy. If you send me an email, I can, I can forward it to you. But people have thought about what can you use with clocks. And uh, uh, of course, it will be in combination of all the other classical information we already have. So atoms are, are great oscillators. They're perfect oscillators. So if new physics affects atomic energy levels, and not all new physics will affect atomic energy levels, but uh, quite a few actually effects do, that is will change the atomic frequency. But you can ask, well, how would I know? It's because it affects is different and different atoms, molecules, nuclei. So what do you actually measure? You measure ratios of two clocks. And you pick one which is not sensitive and pick one which is very sensitive. And the great thing about atoms, we can compute things so precisely. I can change fundamental constant in my code, and I can tell you what effect it will have on atomic clock. Make sure you not forget to change it back. OK. So atomic clocks already been used for variation of fundamental constants. That was initially motivated by some astrophysical uh, measurements from light of, uh, from distance uh, uh, quasars, which show about four, alpha, four sigma deviations. That's kind of got to two sigma at this point, but it's motivated that initial effort. 
people for initially look for stereo drift in fundamental constants, but recently it's been realized that dark matter can actually source oscillations or transient changes in fundamental constants. People, we have looked at violation of Lorentz invariance, position invariance, it's actually quite simple. You just wait until your clock goes around the sun and see if there is any difference. And there have been proposals for gravitation wave detection. They're actually very strongly linked to atomic interferometer proposals because at that point, atomic interferometer will use exactly the same ski uh, atoms as the clock. So I will start with the relation of fundamental constants. So there have been a lot of ideas which involve some sort of light scalar fields. And with light scalar fields, you can induce variation of fundamental constants. And the reason why it works is because the frequency of all atomic transition depends on fine structure constant. So if the fine structure constant changes, you have a measurable effect on clock ratios. But it's been recently realized, and I'll show how, that ultralight dark matter can actually source the violation of variation of fundamental constants. And as a result, if you look for variation of fundamental constants, you can actually look at it as a direct dark matter detection experiment. And in this case, if we look at landscape of dark matter masses, we're actually sitting here in ultralight uh, region and uh, about under 10 EV. So as soon as you can ask, what's the difference? Why this 10 EV kind of boundary? Because at this point, your dark matter behaves in a wave-like matter. Why? Because if you look at De Broglie volume, at that point, you will have more than one particle at De Broglie volume. Eventually, you have quite a large occupational numbers of particles per De Broglie volume. It also has to be bosonic. OK, you just cannot pack that many fermions now, galaxies. The Fermi, escape, the Fermi velocity is larger than escape velocity at 10 electron volts. So you can't have fermionic dark matter of this kind. And then your dark matter be just becomes in classical wave, meaning it's coherent on the scale of your detector and network of detector. Therefore, you no longer can actually just wait until it hits your detector and look for energy deposition. So much better detection is to anything which actually look for the wave-like coupling currents. Uh, the interesting point is that actually astrophysically, it will manifest itself differently. Already now, we have uh, astrophysical simulations and measurements which show that if dark matter less than 21 has to be about, if it's a 100% dark matter, it has to be heavier than about 10 to the minus 21 EV because it makes the galactic structures fuzzy. That's why it's called a fuzzy dark matter. And why? Because eventually your wavelengths for dark matter is so long, it will actually be longer than the smallest galaxies. So in this case, that's why it will make your galactic structure look a little fuzzy. And uh, uh, at about 10 to the minus 18 EV, it stops mattering. So those methods will be eventually sensitive to about 10 to the minus 18 EV, but they, they still have about three orders of magnitude to go. So there's this very interesting astrophysical effort to see if there is dark matter as a particle or as a wave. Of course, I'm sure it could be both. I mean, it could be the whole standard dark standard model out there. Uh, and then you can ask yourself, well, but how do you detect something? I don't know what that is, right? Well, but we have to remember, you know, our physics. And we don't care that we don't know what it is. Okay, we wish we did, but we don't know. But it's still a scalar, pseudo-scalar, or a vector. Okay, axial vector tensor, people kind of run out of, uh, you know, uh, imagination at that point. But if it's a scalar, we know how it could couple with the standard model. So we can write a coupling to the standard model Lagrangian. And then we can ask a question, what can it do to the precision sensors? It can cause precessions of nuclear of electron spins. A lot of magnetometry, of course, is using this. You can drive current electromagnetic system for just produce photons. That's how many action searches are done. You can induce equivalent principle violating acceleration of matter. Why? Because, well, you just coupled your entire standard model Lagrangian in some weird way, uh, meaning that it could couple differently to protons, neutrons, electrons, photons, to oscillating field. Therefore, equivalence principle goes out of the window. Or you can modulate the values of fundamental constants of nature. And uh, what that will do, it will either change all the transition frequencies in local gravitational field, and it actually affects the size of the uh, macroscopic bodies, like cavities, for example. Because now, all of the lengths inside of those uh, structures are proportional to the Bohr radius, and now this is changing too. So how does that actually work? So here, you just coupled your oscillating field that's a scalar coupling. So scalar coupling could just 
you could just multiply your standard model Lagrangian by a scalar or a square of scalar, etc. Here are your normal photons, electrons, gluons, quarks. And what it does, essentially, you just got another term in alpha. So now your alpha is changing and your masses are changing. And that's what calls changing in frequencies. So here is, let's run over the logic again for the ultralight. And this flux we about like right here, 10 to the minus 11 or 12, just based on how clocks operate. Right? So dark matter field couples to electromagnetic interaction in normal matter. It will make fundamental coupling constants and mass ratios oscillate. It will make all of the energy levels oscillate. Clock frequency is also oscillate. And that can be monitored by detecting ratios of clock frequencies over time. So go to your lab and look at your clock for as long as you want to, or can, or until you graduate. OK, and that depending, of course, uh, which dark matter you're looking for, that depends on how long you want to do it and how frequently you want to do it. So here, uh, over your entire measurement, you would like to fit at least one dark matter oscillation. If you have more than one per your uh, wait time for the clock time, you need to use some sort of special dynamic decoupling, otherwise you're smearing the oscillation. So what then you do? Okay, so you have measures the ratios of the time frequencies, let's say every second. Then you do the Fourier transfer, the discrete Fourier transform, go from time domain to frequency domain. And here you have your dark matter signal. This is a peak at the Compton frequency of your dark matter. This is essentially direct detection signal. It's also broadband. You look at all frequencies at once. And yes, you will have a laser noise and all the other noise. You need to know your frequency noise really well. But on the other hand, you should see it with all the clocks which are sensitive enough and know, we know what the ratios of amplitudes would be. So uh, one oscillation of dark matter per second, it's about 10 to the minus 15 EV. One per 11 days is about 21 EV. And here are the limits. Here are the coupling of dark matter to photons. Here's the equivalence principle bound for microscope mission. Here is the at wash experiment. Here is the old drift experiments we analyzed. Here's a new experiment, and it's a very recent idea, less than five years. Here's the projected experiment. Okay. And then, of course, the next question is how do you improve it much, much further? And here, of course, the obvious reason well, you just improve the clock. You improve the clock, that entire thing just goes down proportional exactly to improvement of your clock. And then there is, of course, many, many reasons how you can do it. You can measure beyond the quantum limits that's already being pursued. You'll have it in five years. Uh, you can actually get statistics much, much better. You have much larger number of ions or atoms in your clocks. You can entangle clocks, or you can build different clocks. In one way, it's the novel clocks, another highly charged ion clocks, but another is the nuclear clock. So any questions up to now? Okay. So, so far, we based all clocks on atomic transitions. What about the nuclei? Yes, there is a much effort in molecular transitions. We just need to control molecules just a little bit better. We'll get there. But the nuclei, it's a fundamental big issue. And the biggest issue here is the transition wavelengths. Because what we need to do, we need to build a laser at that frequency. In all transitions and nuclei are somewhere in MEV range. I'm a very optimistic person. Even I'm not optimistic that we'll have MEV lasers anytime soon. So there is one exception. So here are where a lot of transitions are. And there is one exception, thorium to 29 nuclei, for whatever reason, has a transition in the laser accessible region. And uh, right now, it's measured about 150 nanometers, about plus minus 3 nanometers. It's a fantastic transition for the clock. It's a very highly protected, of course, from all the systematics because it's nicely cushioned by those all atomic electrons. So, uh, and it will work pretty much. It could work exactly as atomic clock does, only now you're exciting the nuclear transition. And uh, we actually are now funded with our ARC collaborators, Thorsten Schum, Eckhart Pike, and Peter Theorov to actually build three of those prototype clocks in the next six years. Yes. <coughs> Ooh, all of those are atoms. The red things are atoms. Those are atomic frequencies. 
Yeah, the, just for comparison, we actually plot uh, like atomic, this is atomic right. shell transitions. Sorry, I should have mentioned. There is a uranium one right here, but uh, that's kind of, you know, too far index UV. So. And if you're interested in, you know, how to build a nuclear clock, we actually published uh, research proposals. We are now about two years into the project. Uh, and uh, essentially it means that you have to get to the point that our nuclear physics methods give us about, you know, about factor of five better than right now. And then there's a lot of lasers are being built. You, you first scan with a kind of gigahertz field laser, then this frequency comp, and then with ultra precision frequency comps. But this is understood how to do it. So why do we want to do it? Well, you know, besides the fact that it's so cool to excite nuclei by a laser nuclear transition. It's only one you have to play with for now. And then also it's a, it's a fantastic fundamental physics study device. So if you actually look at the scalar dark matter, that's the best device to search for it in a fairly large range. It will be better by many orders of magnitude than any other device you can actually build. The reason being because the scale which defines variation of alpha, it's a coolant energy difference, which is expected to be about MAV scale, but your transition is in EV. So you have about factor five or four or five orders of magnitude enhancement. And more than that, it actually also links a strong interaction part to get a total binding energy. So there is a um, sensitivity to the quark masses and the QCD scale. So we do expect to have some prototypes within five years and high precision clock within 10 years. And that's actually not me, that's my experimentalist telling me. Uh, my experimental colleagues. So, and the, just to put in the perspective how large effort it is, there is a snow mass paper which was officially solicited by conveners. There is about 60 people volunteers to actually contribute to it, and this just about scalar and vector dark matter. There is also the action and Alps paper as well. And for the first time, we decided to put all the current limits and some of the main projections on the same plot. Beware, it looks scary. I told you it looks scary. Uh, okay. So here is the present clock limit. So that, that plot which I showed before, it's right here. Here are the EP limits. Uh, here are uh, cavity limits, but they will get much, much better soon. Here are projections for the mechanical oscillator. And here, as you see, oh, here's a, a kilometer size interferometer. And here's a nuclear clock. In principle, the dynamic decoupling, you can actually extend it like right this as well. Here is some idea for the natural mass, but honestly, we have absolutely no idea what the natural scale is. It could be electron mass or it could be a TV actually scale. The TV scale is extremely unlike Calibico. That's what built for Higgs. There's no reason which light <coughs> part would be at that scale. Here's also the current astro bound. Here's a possible projected astro bound. And here, as I said, that's the reason why we want to build a nuclear clock. There are also three other common plots in the paper, if in case you're interested. And now in the remaining uh, some time, I will talk about some new efforts about sending clocks and other quantum technologies to space. And the reason this first, yes. Okay, so the strings, uh, first, so first, uh, uh, there is also, there's a possible either magnetic dipole electric quadruple transition, the dipole will dominate, it's a nuclear transition. So as of now, we estimate uh, somewhere within 2000 seconds lifetime. So it's a very weak transition, but it's sufficient uh, to excite with a with frequency count. So we don't know exactly what the lifetime is. So uh, there have been efforts and measurements. You know exactly they, the only thing they know experimentally is more than sixty seconds. But the theory projections tells us uh, probably a few thousand, but not that too many thousand. Yes, maybe one hundred. You can also explain the circumstances by counting them. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, that's what people are actually now doing. It's called electronic bridge. So the, the question uh, actually for people on Zoom was, uh, can you actually use electronic transitions to extend the nuclear transition? Yes. So what you want is you want to find the electronic transition, which is very close in frequency. People have been actually using that to scan. Uh, in fact, like in thorium 35 plus, you almost have almost exact transition. So yes, they, and uh, that will do it, it will increase the rate, but it will very heavily dependent on what exactly the transition frequency is and how close do you get for it. There are orders of magnitude differences. Uh, here and there. So yes, this is one of the pathways to look for it. And another pathway uh, to look not in a single thorium, but what's what's being done, you have embedding microscopic number of thorums into the, into the solid indigo crystal, transparent crystal. And in this case, you want to excite microscopic number of thorium. Now for the running clocks, there are disadvantages to coupling to electronic levels because that can induce noise. 
So it'd probably be best to actually run on specific unsensitive transitions <coughs> when actually electronic parts uh, uh, don't contribute much. So you really just directly want to excite the nuclear transition. In a solid state, you would be directly excited nuclear transitions, period. It's a sorry info plus. So the main scheme exists so for the first excitations, for the scanning, you want as big a straight as possible. You want a couple of two electrons. You want as many nuclei as possible. For the clock, you want as clean a system as possible eventually. So the proposal has been published. We've been demonstrated about 10 to the minus 19 is achieved. Okay. So the NASA actually has ongoing decadal survey in biological and physical sciences in space. The ESA actually sort of had the survey and they asked for the community to sign up, come up with a plan because it's been recognized as those, as those are not space qualified things. No one thought about space qualifying them. Qualifying them. BC uh, had actually been achieved in space and the atom interferometry being demonstrated in space. Uh, but the clocks, uh, optical frequency comps have been demonstrated on the Saudi rockets. But uh, there is a lot of reasons why you want to send various quantum technologies to space for fundamental physics and also practical reasons like navigation. So first, many effects could be screened on Earth. Dark energy, has, if it's a field, is a screen on Earth. Quadratic interactions, dark matter would be screened on Earth for the same reason. Also, you have access to the variable gravitational potential. You're highly limited in probing gravity if you're sitting in the gravitational wave you know, potential of Earth. So you want to be out of the gravity well. You want to actually be able to link the Earth-bound clocks. You need to be in space to do it. There is no way otherwise, unless somebody let us mess with transatlantic cables, which I'm not going to, uh, to actually connect clocks on different continents. Also, if you want to search for various frequencies of gravitational waves, you actually should be in space. Uh, if you test Lorentz invariance for gravity, you want to be in space. So there are many also opportunities for GR, uh, various GR tests. And of course, you have microgravity along baselines. There are many, many advantages. So we actually proposed, I've been invited to participate for to see what fundamental physics you can do with this focus proposal when you have an optical clock the current optical clock, the 10 to the minus 18 clock, not the future clocks, uh, on elliptical okay. orbit. So it will pass uh, about 5,000 kilometers and 22,000 kilometers away. And it actually will be linked to Earth with the optical link. And uh, it will compare the ratios of clock on a satellite and on Earth. So what does it give you? It would actually test whether the frequency change really scales as it should be exactly with the gravitational potential. We can actually get orbit determination extremely well. We would know which potential would that be in. And uh, that's what's called anomalous gravitational redshift. If you see that mode being zero, this is not GR anymore. And the best test right now is a Galilea satellite of the proposed clocks in Europe, which still didn't fly, but that would be orders and orders of magnitude better. And there's other things which you can do. It can do other tests of relativity, it does some post-Newtonian parameters, but this test is already 30,000 times better. It can look for some various topological dark matter, just of fundamental constants, and also it can establish the high accuracy international frequency reference just by linking all the clocks on Earth. And then another thing which you do, been inspired by Parker's solar probe. Who've heard of that? Anyone? That touched the sun. That satellite literally was like 5 million miles away from the sun and it didn't die. It actually still transmits data, it actually went to another series of elliptical orbit. So it actually looked for the magnetic fields and the particles uh, in the environment of the sun. So that was the closest approach, 4.89 uh, miles. And that's literally already the limit of, you know, extension of solar corona. It will, the final approach will be even closer than that. So we were curious. What if you put clocks in there? And of course, I mean, that was an uh, idea of uh, you died Tsai. And uh, talking with, you know, with my particle physics colleagues, it kind of makes me wonder, okay, all three of us are theorists. Like, how do we know those just don't die there? Okay, well, they, so we talked to GPL people. We talked also to Parker Solar Pro people. And uh, it's remarkable, the, the GPS said, but we actually wanted to say send microwave clocks to like, 10 radius away from the sun in 2001. But that actually uh, uh, never fly. They actually wanted to do something different, look at the, uh, this position, uh, position test to look at the um, uh, null redshift test in the Fourier fundamental constants. But the point is that uh, remarkably, if you're actually not that close to the sun, if you're still at the Parker solar probe limit or like 0.1 atomic unit, the magnetic fields are manageable, but the difference in the gravitational potential are manageable. 
and uh, uh, the thermal effects are actually quite manageable. So in this case, what we want to do, we want to essentially pack the clock comparison lab and send it to space. So you have two clocks on board and you compare frequency of those two clocks. Why do you care? Why do you care being near the sun? It's because when you ask a question, how much dark matter you have in the solar system? The answer is that we do not know. What we do know, it's an average dark matter density in the galaxy. We don't have any clue what's the distribution of dark matter in the galaxy. We don't know, well, uh, some ideas, but we don't have any idea what exactly how much dark matter is in our solar system. What we do know is how much uncertainty we have on the mass of the sun. And that's actually a fairly big uncertainty, about 10 to the minus, I think, uh, 8 or 10 to the minus 10. We do know how much extra mass you can tolerate between, say, Mercury and Mars and Saturn orbits, because we have orbits of those planets measured very well. But this uh, limits on extra mass. And we don't know whether it's a normal mass, standard model mass, or the dark matter mass. The limits on how much dark matter you can have on the sun and still not mess with the solar physics and luminosity is ridiculous. It's like 2% of the sun would be dark matter and we wouldn't know about. So you place a reasonable limits on the, um, what dark matter you can have. And also with a dark matter in principle can actually bind to the gravitational objects. So you could have bound halo around the sun. And that's the important point. You will have much more dark matter to detect here. And that's what we want. And also, if you have some self-interactions for ultralight dark matter, that can actually make dense objects like uh, uh, relaxing stars. And that can actually bind into the gravitational objects as well. And here, the over densities could actually be uh, 10 to the 17 orders of magnitude compared to the, our expected uh, amount of dark matter. And that actually, as you see, will be in a very specific mass range. And this is like a perfect for the clocks. So what we look, I uh, want to look to this uh, sound healer. About here, we look at this relaxion dark matter model, which is actually solved, proposed to solve the hierarchy problem. And what we find that even if we have like 10 to the minus 18 clocks, that we actually would be well within already the naturalness model. If we actually one of those clocks is a nuclear clock, we, if this scale is there, we will find it. such mission will find it. So that was quite interesting. Uh, of course, the biggest issue here, here is how atomic clock, look, clock looks like. How do you send this to space? Well, but this looks much better. This is actually a Stronson clock, which is as accurate as the ones I showed you. And this is about, that's what your clock. Okay, here's the two laser boxes, but this is already one cubic meter. And uh, those clocks we actually put in the bottom and the top of the sky tower to measure actually the sky tower uh, uh, height. And actually that's one of those GR tests actually came from this. So now, I mean, this is a, you know, a technological issue, but in principle that actually could fly in 10 years. And then in the last few seconds, the new ideas in gravitational wave detection. So of course we now have Ligon, Virgin, Cargon, those are fantastic devices, but those devices will always be limited in terms of which dark matter, or excuse me, <laughs> or which gravitational waves they can detect. Just because you have a seismic activity on earth and that uh, anything below one hertz is extremely, that, I mean, that we cannot see. You can probably get to a few hertz with those detectors. <clears throat> and of course, now there's LISA, which is going to build in space, and that's going to be uh, you know, somewhere right there. But that's not how astronomy works, right? It's not like we can say, OK, we build an optical detector and X-ray, and that's it. We don't care about all the other regions. No, we want all of them. We want visible, we want microwave, we want radio, we want X-ray, we want gamma rays. And we had built all of those different um, devices in, this, in our electromagnetic spectrum. And that's a basic idea. We actually would like to be able to probe the entire region of gravitational waves. And now this is your Earth detectors. This is LISA. And here actually is the many proposals in the DC Hertz range. And uh, the atomic interferometry has been proposed, and the clocks have been proposed, and you know various uh, structures on the moon has been proposed as well. And in this region, actually, between the pulse of timing array and LISA, there is also this proposal by uh, Peter Graham and Sir Trenenjan actually uh, to put clocks on asteroids and actually essentially arrange the asteroidal distance changes due to gravitational waves with the precision of a micron. That's actually what current clocks can do. So, uh, and you can say, well, what's the largest interferometer been ever built? Right now it's 10 meters. But there is a 100 meter atom interferometer right now being built in the Fermilab. And there is also Ziga in China. And uh, there is also 
in ion and the uh, and mega and there is you know much much now effort in atomic physics which is no longer table talk. So the next stage will be one kilometer. So the year is 2022, and we have to remember yes we are talking about very fundamental questions. What is dark matter? What is dark energy? What resolves baryon matter antimatter symmetry? Can we build quantum theory of gravity? And those seem to be very abstract, very fundamental questions. But we have to remember 100 years ago, the question is how to explain atomic spectra was also extremely abstract. Even when people used it to build a laser, they didn't know what it was for. And now we can imagine our life without our technology, which was built essentially on quantum mechanics. So in 21, 22, when we hopefully solve at least some of those fundamental problems, what new wonders will that bring? I would like to thank you for your attention and our group at the University of Delaware and all of our collaborators. Thank you so much. Mariana, if uh, you're in the audience here, you can uh, just raise your hand uh, to ask any questions. If you're remote, uh, you can raise your hand um, or put a, uh, a question in the chat window. Question. So we've also shown a uh, atom in the processor. Can you say something about the difference in sensitivity uh, when, when would you want to use a clock when you want to do the number in the front? So I guess some of them, a couple more to use gravitational waves or the other words, a couple of other parts. So honestly, what interferometer is greatest is measuring phase. And eventually, that's what you want for gravitational wave detection. So eventually, I think it's probably going to be some way of hybrid. In fact, that atom interferometer is very close to the clock. So you almost run it in a clock uh, kind of uh, like fashion, because what you want, you essentially want to measure the distance between the satellites. So, but uh, I would think also for gravitational wave detection, uh, in this case, atomic interferometry proposals uh, uh, seem to be more advanced and more work has to be, because in principle, we have a better idea of how to build those structures with clocks to detect gravitational wave in two orders of magnitude better. So for the dark matter detection of case, nuclear clock would actually be actually better than the, uh, the you know, in large scale interferometry for the large fraction of uh, your parameter space for the scale of dark matter. But clocks are not sensitive to vector dark matter and atom interferometers are. So the, you know, for the B minus L type of models that actually the atom interferometer has unique sensitivity for the ultralight dark matter, for example. So it depends on application. I think the rotational wave detector, I'm eager to see whether this 100 meter interferometer performs as expected. It's a huge advance from the 10 years. Questions from students? Of course, absolutely, and everyone. Oh, yes. Uh, that's uh, kind of, let's, let's see if we can actually get it uh, from this one. So we're essentially looking for a specific system. Okay. So first, there are different. There is a lot of period. Oh, I'm not sure what. No, upper right. Okay, I, I know uh, something happens with the zoom. Sorry for the zoom people, and now it shows no. It's not sure why. Okay, yes. So uh, here, essentially, what they want, uh, they want to find a case where the effect of the parity violation in nuclear is enhanced. So this is essentially search for anapole moments. Because there is a discrepancy between anapole moment and cesium and what nuclear physics predicts, which is not understood. It's been 20 years. We've done all the atomic theory analysis for it. The nuclear physics analysis for it is complicated. So that's basically the idea is that to look for anapole moments. Yes? You are not the first person to ask. In fact, uh, uh, there have been a, a roadmap which is produced by CERN and quantum physics was a part of it. And they asked me to ask everyone else what, what you're going to have in the last five, 10, 15, 20 years. 
I couldn't find anyone to tell anything beyond 10 years, except that we will have better magnets. Everyone wants better magnets. So if you hope like long time, long time from now, we will eventually have better magnets. But uh, speaking truthfully, uh, quantum sensors did not exist 20 years ago, at least not anywhere close to the limit. The optical, I remember when people in 2005 talked about optical atomic clocks, even 2010, we will want to get to 10 to the minus 18. And now we are here, we are much earlier than we thought we would. And uh, we are kind of past that and we didn't notice. <clears throat> so what I think is going to happen is that we actually have a plethora of different clocks. We'll finally get molecular clocks. We will have a nuclear clock. We will have also, we will finally have all those clocks linked because eventually if we at least with fly frequency comes hopefully to space to link the clocks. And uh, also we will do much better networks. So I, I envision now there is already a network of magnetometers looking for weird effects like domain walls crossing Earth. I envision that we will just have a network of high precision detectors. But honestly, five years ago, we had no idea how to search for dark matter with clocks. So what we need, honestly, I think also how to use entanglement as a resource, because we would finally have spin spin clock by this time, in, even in five years. And I think we will have probably entangled, uh, entangled chains and we will have much larger scale quantum computing. And it's very interesting to see, you know, interplay between gravity and quantum mechanics in which large scale quantum devices <laughs> in the suns. I also hope that quantum sensors will fly to space by that time. So in high precision clocks. And it'll be very, very interesting what you can do with this. But beyond that, honestly, the future had been much more fun than me even all thought. So I, do, I honestly do not know beyond 10 years. Right. So essentially, a nuclear physics has been measuring nuclear transitions for the several decades. And that just accumulated body of research in nuclear physics. We also don't understand why this nuclear in this case. And it's a great idea, but I have to say that I, I talk about clocks, but there's a great many other experiments, there's fantastic EDM experiments. Also, I think if we see new physics, we will see the electron EDM and the action searches. There is just so many stuff coming. And our, I think our ability also is not just to build clocks, but to build lasers. Because if we have uh, uh, XUV lasers, then we have the whole variety of different transitions we can look for. Because right now we have cold high HH ions, so we have access to XUV uh, transitions, which will be in regime of something which is very cold. But we don't have lasers yet. We almost have lasers, and we have 10 nanometers, 40 nanometers, but not enough yet to excite the really the metastable transition. Enough to actually probe the transition, not quite enough to excite. But that's been developing extremely rapidly. So actually, I think the development of lasers and developing cooling techniques and actually having molecules in the lattice, uh, so many things are coming as well. So and uh, I kind of we, we, we find more and more particle physics that are interested in what we can do and how quickly things can be done. So it's an exciting new world. You mentioned uh, EOPI astronomy. Uh, what about the, the prospects for optical clocks in optical I think, and I know very little about VLBI, and the, it's, it's unclear right now in space what would be the requirement of the clock. Like, does it, is a DSAC, for example, okay? Is times minus 15 okay? So just what long-term drift we would need. But I think with VLBIs, what we need is actually it's transmission of optical information. So because, uh, and I think that's one of the issues. I mean, the interesting proposals actually uh, in, in this way, how would you directly link the VLBIs without actually literally recording the data and transmitting? And that's actually, I think, a very interesting optics problem in quite possibly quantum communication problem. So, would you mind repeating the questions uh, whenever they're? Oh, I am so very sorry. Okay, the question was about VLBIs. You know, can you use clocks for VLBIs and what would we need? Sorry, I, I started and then, of course, I forgot. Okay. Thank you. Questions from Zoom or from the audience? Well, if there are no more questions, uh, that brings us right to 
five o'clock. So let's thank Mariana again.